between Weber and Williams. Well, you, we want to welcome all of you that were watch, watching George Washington versus Temple. We're here at Fiesta Bowl in Richland, Washington for the finals of the Northwest Classic. Our opening match, two great ones, two 22-time champions, Pete Weber versus Walter Ray. We're using lanes 31 and 32 here at Fiesta Bowl. Pete Weber leaves the four pin on the opening shot and Marshall contrast of styles here Weber hooking it all over the lane and Walter going straighter yeah and actually Pete is throwing the ball a lot straighter right now than he was earlier in practice or yesterday in match play he'll go hard and straight at the four pin and no problem well no lack of experience between these two guys Walter Ray has made 88 previous television appearances. His record in that uh, stretch is 83 and 70 with a fabulous 228 average. And he's showing he can hook it a little bit, isn't he? Yeah, but you know, you see Walter Ray. Walter Ray throwing the ball a little more hook than normal. You see Walter Ray's approach. Very familiar, five steps, starts the ball in the second, about shoulder high, good knee bend, and reaches out really, really far with those very long arms and just puts everything into every shot yeah he doesn't uh, he doesn't hold anything back and I think that's really as I said earlier one of his great assets is that he just really lets it go time for a quick double oh perfect absolutely perfect and maybe just a little more intensity because he is bowling against Pete Weber well these two guys are number one and two on the career money list uh, within just about twenty some thousand dollars of each other too yeah I don't think uh, Walter wants to give Pete any chance to get back that number one spot of the money lead. The winner here will take home $18,000 of the tournament, not this game. Pete Weber drills it in there. A little different as we watch Pete Weber. Another five step. He does start it in the second step like Walter, but look at that high backswing. So fluid though. Yeah, very, very. As we see the ball rolling down the lane, it looks like it's hooking a lot, but trust me, I watched Pete bowl this week. That's pretty straight for Pete. Oh, only my dreams. <laughs> oh, the double for Weber. So our two champions, as his wife looks on, Tracy. His wife, Tracy. She uh, is wearing a microphone, by the way. And uh, she is uh, almost as animated as her husband, Pete. She gets excited, as uh, many of the wives do. Walter Ray taking very little time. And I'm sure Walter's wife, Paige, is very pleased to see her man start out with three in a row. All business between these two guys. Walter Ray, 37 years of age now, 6'2", 180 pounds, lives in Stockton, California. Last week, just had about a 30-minute trip to the tournament. This week, has to commute a little further, though. A little bit further, as he goes for four in a row on the left-hand lane. A little left of target. Ooh, no All split. Right, don't do that. Get the ball out there. Leaves the 3-6. Right, get it out. He's talking to himself. He says he wants to get the ball out. He cut that ball a little bit short, did not get it out to the target. That ball was left when it left his hand it was a border two to the left of what his target was he'll go hard and straight at the spare known for being a great spare shooter Ooh. all right and he doesn't disappoint back it in there our opening match eight pins separates these two great bowlers who's going to come out on top well we'll find out when we come back stay with us please up in the fourth frame trailing by eight pins can take the lead with one more strike right here working on a double In Pete's only other appearance this year, he was the champion. Give that one more room. Oh! Boy, I saw a little bit of everything up there, Marshall. Well, Pete wasn't sure when he threw this ball whether he was going to get the break, as Tracy, his wife, is very appreciative of that. But they don't all have to be perfect, huh? perfectly high flush. Now, if you're going to make money on the PBA Tour, you got to have the light ones, the high ones, the solid ones. And you know he wants to take advantage of that good break right now. 
And he does. Team Weber, four in a row. Now Walter Ray is behind as he heads into the fifth frame, trailing by 12 pins. And Walter Ray is a three-time PBA Player of the Year as we see Pete Weber's ball go into the pocket. Watch the 10 pin. It's, it fell fairly quick, but it was the only one that Pete thought may stand. You know, they say a perfect strike is where the ball hits the 1-3-5-9. That was perfect. Of course, so was that, but it left the 10 pin. Just a little bit of a flat hit. Through the ball. Now he's talking to himself. Walter is about getting through the ball. He really... He's very honest in his assessment of his own deliveries. At the 10 pin. As he converts it, by the way, Marshall, that is the 91st single pin spare this year, and 88 of them have been converted. That's because I haven't been on the show. <laughs> well, we've got two great spare shooters, uh, both with Walter and Pete, bowling in our first match. Weber looks like he's uh, taking it all in. Perfect. Walter back on the strike path, but trails by 13 pins with Weber working on four in a row headed to the sixth frame. Going for five in a row. Look at the concentration. Will it hit it? Yes! Weber's really been on a hot streak, doing well. I asked him, why are you bowling so well lately? Well, Mike, uh, I've been bowling really well at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. I'm just throwing the ball really well. I have a lot of confidence, and I'm ready to win again. It looks like he is ready to win again. And he's starting to get some good breaks on TV, which really, really helps your, your mental health. <laughs> Running it out, but leaves the 10 pin nevertheless. A little disappointed, but uh, still uh, keeping the ball in play, making good shots. He's had some good carry, carried that high hit, carried the light hit the previous frame. Needs to compose himself. He'll go hard and straight at the 10 pin. With the conversion, he will lead by 22. Ooh, he gets it. Weber, 22 ahead. Walter Ray working on a strike. Can come back when we come back. Stay with us. Walter Ray, as we can see, trails by 22, but he's in the seventh frame, working on a strike, can cut it to 12. Big shot here. Yeah, we'll see how his experience will help him out. Coming out of commercial, can he get the job done? He does. He gets the job done. Now it's down to 12 pins. And as that ball hit the pocket and all, and all the pins fell down, I got to look at Pete Weber. He sort of had a little bit of a pensive look on his face as we see Walter Ray's ball rolling down lane 32 it's coming in nice and flush gets the 10 pin no trouble with the 10 there no, no. not at all <coughs> can cut it to two with the strike here has to hurry <laughs> leaves that 10 pin yelling at it but it didn't do any good well, Walter had to like the way through that ball. He's sort of shaking his head, wondering, well, what can I do? I'm through the ball just the way I wanted to. Now trailing by 13 pins is Walter Ray Williams, Jr. You can listen to his ball roll down the lane for his spares. No chance of that hooking too much, is <laughs> Well, with that hard ball rolling over the thumb hole, it's not hooking at all. 13 pins the difference. Weber headed to the eighth frame. He has the 13 pins. And you would figure with these two 22-time titleists, you would get a, a very professionally bold game. Both bowling very well right now. Weber shooting on a 230 pace. Walter Ray on a 220. Well, they are both just zoned in right here. Tracy is watching and you know, the as intense as he does. Yeah, and all, and all she can do is just is just kind of pray that Pete's able to get it done. 71 titles on the telecast today, Mike. Even if he doesn't strike, yes, I understand. Here, he uh, still can double in the 10th and win. Walter can't lock him out if he doesn't strike. But he does. Oh, and that's a powerful strike. 
but very much the same hit that he had the last time on 31 where he left the 10 pin. This time, watch this ball come from right field and strong into that 1-3 pocket. Boy, that's six. He's bouncing the 7 and the 10 out of there. Walter A. trailing by 23. Has to just wire it out. Got to hurry. Boy, it did, didn't it? That ball went a little longer. Came real hard in the back end. 23 pins. Walter, if he takes it out the sheet, 246. And that would leave Weber with a 18 fill to win the match. Well, it's a tough position to be in to have to take it out to even have a prayer. Well... But you know Walter's going to be giving it his best chance right here. He made a real good shot last time, leaving the solid 10. I think Pete would just soon he didn't strike here. Oh, nice break there. He says, thank you, thank you. I think he's saying, that's one for me. <laughs> Pete had a similar shot earlier in the game. This is Walter right. Ray Williams with the ball very high. There goes the four, there goes the seven, there goes the ten, and here goes the smile. It's interesting how some of those trip fours happen on that extra high hit, where a little lighter you leave it. Yeah, that's kind of the uh, interesting part of the game of bowling. Sometimes a little bit more of a miss. He can cut it for three pins. Oh, and he does. What a game between these two 22-time champions. Phil Ball's important. It's very important. He needs to get every pin he can. 246 will leave him three pins down, and it will force Pete Weber to more than just show up in the 10th frame. He'd have to go, what, nine spare nine? Nine spare nine would get it done, or strike. eight spare strike, or any combination of 18 fill, but Walter wants to get this strike, and then Pete wants to strike the first ball in the 10th. Hi. Oh, the 3-6 again. Trust it, man. Maybe a little bit of a mental lapse for Walter Ray Williams as he finishes with 244. Now Pete Weber only needs to fill 16. 16. Yeah, as I, as I do my quick addition, which apparently wasn't quick enough. Both of us have our calculators <laughs> out here feverishly figuring this out. Of course, our statistician, Phil Ringener, always has it figured out. Weber for the win. He just loves that. You know, Mike, it's only the fifth tournament of 1997, but I just know Pete Weber's thinking about this could be my year to be player of the year. He's never been PBA player of the year. Walter Roy Williams has had it three times. Pete Weber's thinking, it's my turn. A little safety shot there, just hard and straight. Right down the middle of the lane, keep it out of the channel. Tracy says, nice going, hon. <laughs> P. Weber with a conversion finishes with 258. Defeats Walter Ray Williams Jr. with 244. What a great opening match. When we come back, we're going to look at an average builder of how to make a spare, which we don't see too much of today. Stay here. For our average builders this week, we're going to look at another very difficult spare that's left in our ESPN telecast and also left in your league play. And that spare is the dinner bucket, which is the 2458 for right handed players and the 3569 for left handed players. We're going to look at two different ways to make this spare. The first way is shooting it off of my strike line, the second way will be moving left. Let's look at the first way first, of course. That is, I want to shoot it off of my strike line. And the question is, how far right do I move? And the mathematical answer is that I move five boards to the right and use my strike target. Very simple. There is one fly in the ointment, though, that in many bowling centers, there's a lot more oil in the middle of the lane than there is on the outside. So you may have to add one or two boards to that equation to make it work. But in this center, five boards right moves. And it looks like this. Now, the problem with this method is that it's definite possibility of chopping the two off the five. The target is right around the second arrow. You can see the ball going. It looks like a chop, but not quite. We still convert the two, four, five, eight. Well, how do we avoid that chop? That leads us to our second method. That is moving left on the approach, throwing the ball dead straight at the two pin. Maybe you want to use a ball that doesn't hook nearly as much. Now, the only fallacy to this method is there's a possibility that you could leave that back pin, the eight pin, because the ball won't be driving. 
But let's look at this. I move left and go straight at the two pin. It looks like this. I'm trying to throw this ball as straight as I possibly can, and I'm aiming right straight at the two pin, hard and straight. And it goes right between the two, four, five, eight. The ball hit every pin. And that's how you convert both of these ways. Which way is the best way? The one that you feel the most comfortable with. Next week, we're headed south. It's the Oregon Open. That's March the 1st, Saturday, 5.30 Eastern Time. I'll be there with another average builder. Be sure and join us. In our opening match, Pete Weber outlasted Walter Ray Williams, Jr., 258 to 244. That earns him the right to take on the non-winner, Tim Chris. Who will win? We'll find out when we come back. We're back at Fiesta Bowl, where Tim Chris takes on Pete Weber. Marshall, there's 71 titles on the telecast this afternoon, but that's not the most ever on a telecast, is it? No, it's not, Mike. There were 87 titles in the 1981 National Championship in Toledo. And uh, we'll go, we'll watch Tim Chris, he throws his first ball, comes a little high, breaks it down, gets a good break. Dick Weber was on that, tele, that telecast with 25 titles, Earl Anthony with 35, Dave Davis with 18, Gary Dickinson with seven, and Ernie Schlegel was on that show before he ever won, but that's uh, 87. 87. 71 sounds like a lot, but not as many as 87. Cross lane, straight at the six pin. Tim Chris opens up with a nice spare. But spares aren't gonna beat. Pete Weber. Oh, Pete looks so confident in the last game and in, in, in taking on Walter Ray, and I believe that he is experienced enough that he is not looking past Tim Chris. He likes both lanes, but this went a little bit better. Five strikes on this. Yeah, he had, had command of this lane. We'll see as he throws his first ball in the second game if he still has that command. Sure does. I would say so. Well, he, he soared the ball so effortlessly, the speed seems soft, but it's not going high. Yeah, he's got very good control. He's got the, he's got everything matched up. He's got the speed of the ball with the revolutions on the ball and the proper piece of equipment in his hand. For the quick double, as to hurry. Oh, the two. Four, eight. He got that 10 pin out of there though. Got around that ball a little bit at the at release. Wasn't it wasn't behind the ball as much, so the ball looked as if it spun off his hand a little. We can see his ball as he's hoping it'll hook back, but as I said, he got around it a little bit. Fortunate just to leave that particular spare. Ooh. And unfortunate not to make it. Similar to what the tip was, although the 85 pin was not there. But yes, it uh, was. It was basically the bucket without the five pin, which should be easier because you don't have to worry about the chopping it. It looked as if Pete was almost indecisive whether he wanted to hook at it or go straight at it. And, and he, uh, when you're indecisive, usually bad things happen. Yeah. Tim Chris defeated Pete Weber, as you saw in match play. Now is that going to loosen up Tim Chris? Tim Chris, known as the turtle, he throws the ball kind of slow, five steps, shoulder high, nice knee bend, reaches out toward the target, very square at the line. Good and here's balance. his result, just 10 in the pit, no problem. An opportunity to take a 22 pin lead. Doesn't quite get the entire break, there's his wife Sherry. And Sherry would like to wish her younger brother, her younger, bigger brother, Craig, a happy 21st birthday. Apparently, he's six foot five, younger, but bigger. Happy birthday, Craig. At the tip pin, no trouble for Tim Chris. Of course, if you or I are saying it to him, it's happy, happy birthday, Mr. Craig, huh. he's six five. Yes, indeed. Well, Pete has got to feel fortunate but Tim didn't double against him. Back on his good lane. Needs to put that last shot behind him. Well, there's this kind of shot that happens after you go light on one lane. He slowed the speed down. The ball hooked early. 
and right through the heart for four. This is very, very difficult to make, almost impossible. You do have to have the ball hooking into the three pin, send the three into the four seven, and let the ball get the nine. It's got a chance. Look at that, look at that spare, Mike. Oh my gosh, can you believe that? Tracy says if you're going to leave them, make them. Gosh, I'll tell you what, that, ex that excites me. Watch this ball. He throws the ball slow, lets the ball drift far to the right. Now as it comes back, the ball's got to get that back pin. Just an, a, a marvelous cover. I think he even surprised himself. Surprised Tim Chris. Well, they got him pumped right back up. How about a little momentum? That's exactly what he kept there. Well, actually, that uh, monster split, he lost nothing. It's the same as the single pin conversion. Only he gets more momentum. It was a positive. Yeah, it ended up being a very, very big positive, and it, it carried over into the next shot. It's Tim Chris back on lane 32. He was high flush on this lane, the first shot for a strike. And Gittner back in the same exact spot. Doesn't seem to be intimidated at all by Pete Weber. So both players struggling a little bit on the left lane. Left lane seems to be giving them a little problem. The problem with Pete's shot in the second frame was that he was a little bit around the ball and the ball hung. So maybe, maybe there is a little bit more of a hang spot on 31. We'll see. Tim Chris also came in light on 31. Trying for his first double of the match to increase his lead to 22. Looks good. Oh, it didn't get there. Breaks down the 2 8 10 and leaves only the 8 10. Tighten up. Did you heard Tim Chris say something about tightening up. I don't know if he's talking about himself tightening up or if he wants to tighten up his line a little I bit. I think he's saying the lane tightened up. I, yeah, I believe that's probably right. As he goes for just the count, now he's given the great Pete Weber the opportunity to be even in this match. He is already. He can take the lead now. Can go up 10 pins with a strike here in the fifth frame. But what is what kind of an adjustment does he make now? Does he just say, okay, Pete, let's not get slow on this lane? I think he has to say that to yeah. himself. That was the problem in the previous shot on 32. Speed control. Has it. Check out, check out ESPN2 today for a great triple header, a game already in progress. Wake Forest battles Virginia, then at 4 o'clock, it's North Carolina looking to avenge their previous loss to Maryland. Then at 8.30, Colorado State takes on Fresno State. Now to increase the lead to 20 pins. He got fast with that shot. A little over-aggressive, got a little too pumped up through the ball, a little too hard. Leaves the 210. Now, all of a sudden, God, you see a player of his caliber go from being so totally zoned in to being a little bit lost. He needs to make this to keep his lead. Come on, touch it. Just scoots by eight out. So we've got a match here between the non-champion and the 22 titles. The difference in this match right now is six pins. Chris has him. Can he hang on to him? We'll find out. Tim Chris got a reprieve when Weber opened in the sixth frame. Leads by six pins. And by Weber, by Weber missing both those pins, he lost extra two pins in count. Boy, that ball went way wide on the right-hand lane. Tim Chris is an unknown, so I asked him, well, what's the strength of Tim Chris's game? Uh, Mike, I would say my strength is probably uh, projection of the ball. Um, I'm... I would consider myself pretty good at playing break points. Uh, obviously, I throw the ball probably slower than a lot of tour guys, so uh, I will rely a lot on projection to get the ball down the lane. And uh, as long as I'm projecting the ball well, I can get the ball to where I want it down the lane and hopefully strike a lot. And he projects his first double of the match and takes a 16-pin lead. Really puts it on Pete Weber right now. I mean, he, he is telling Pete, by virtue of that double, that... If you want to stay with me, you better start right now. And don't miss. Yeah. That steely-eyed concentration. Good speed. Yeah. Okay. This carry is great. 
needs to keep the speed up on 32 and be careful not to get too fast on 31. 32 seems to be hooking more, breaking harder in the backhand. Lane 31, a little bit of a hang spot. And as they, as they continue to bowl, Mike, they're carrying the oil further down the lane, so they're making that hang spot even bigger. So it could be more problems on this yeah. lane as time goes on. We'll see a speed control on lane 31. Looks like he went around it a little bit more, around that hang spot. Well, he might have gone around a little more, but he kept the speed down, gave the ball the opportunity to hook back into the pocket. Cuts it right back down to six pins. And puts it right back in Tim Chris's court. Okay, I got my double. Now let's see what you can do. Tim is from Bel Air, Maryland. He's 30 years of age. Looking for three in a row. Oh. It's good lane. Boy, oh. can't miss that lane. Bumps it back up to 16 pins, his lead. And that's the lane that he chose to finish on. If he, if he can strike... Watch this shot, Mike. This ball goes way, way, way to the right on about the two board at 45 feet. Comes right back up there and just knocks that 10 out. Thank you very much. He was looking at the 10 pin all the way there. With and this area. is a very, very important shot right here. And I think he's in the he's in the ninth frame. On the tougher of the two lanes. That's he has his de he, he controls his own destiny right now. Pete Weber cannot shut him out. And Pete Weber had better strike because he's down 26 pins. Yeah, if he doesn't strike now, it's all over. Well, Dave is doing a pretty job, pretty good job against the Goliath of this match. The prohibited favorite, Pete Weber. That's a hurl. Oh, it did. Oh, my goodness. Could have been a solid nine. Ball hung in there. Down to 16 pins. This, turn, this match is going right down to the 10th frame, Mike. And Pete seems to be now in the same position that he was in in the previous game as far as being comfortable on the lanes, but he's certainly not comfortable with a 16-pin deficit. Got to have this first one to stay alive. The first one to stay alive, the second one to take the lead. Looks good. Oh, oh you talked about gosh. the solid nine-pin. It's your fault. Oh, that is such such a bad break, but it's so it's so much... A shot of the 90s, of the reactive resin balls. The ball just never, it just doesn't touch the 9-pin. It just goes right past it. Boy, what a great camera shot that was. And now all Pete Weber can do is make the spare, strike for 201, and, and hope for a miracle. Because that's what it will take for him to continue into our next match. 17 pins down, Tracy says no. No. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a shame, but the, the power of today's bowling equipment, that's what can happen. Oh, you can always carry the fill ball, and that's exactly what he's thinking. You know, that's something that never changes, no matter decade to decade or what kind of ball you use, the fill ball always carries. Now, this is kind of an interesting situation. Does Tim Chris move in, throw the ball straight and hard, and just make sure he wins this match, or does he continue to throw his ball close to that channel? He's going with a normal shot. He says, I haven't missed this lane yet. Well, if I'm Norm Duke, I'm not letting Tim Chris finish on 32. Although, his last two shots on 31 were flush also. So, Tim Chris, the non-winner, two, two, two 22 time champions are now disposed of. Yeah, they're, they're out of the way. And the only one left is talking about him. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Tim Chris, first time he missed lane 32, lives the, leaves the 2-8 with a spare conversion. He's going to win this match, 226 to 201. Yeah, Pete did really all he could do in the 10th frame. He made a great shot, and the technology left him a 9-pin. Converts the spare. Tim Chris is the winner of our second match. When we come back, we're going to talk to the proprietor of Fiesta Bowl. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Now let's take a look at the top finishers for the Northwest Classic. Just missing the telecast, Tommy Deluts Jr. He bowled collegiately at William Patterson College in New Jersey and has a degree in communications. 
Bob Benoit was the first pro to ever bowl a 300 game in a televised championship match. Steve Charles, this was his 10th consecutive match play appearance. Joe Furpo, his only title, the Las Vegas doubles with Del Warren. Len Blakey rolled the first 300 of the week and the first since Tucson. Our final score in the second match, the Turtle, Tim Chris races to victory, 226 to 201 over Pete Weber. Setting up the next match, Nor Duke versus Tim Chris. Stay tuned. Back at Fiesta Bowl in Richland, Washington. Tim Chris, he's letting him finish on the right leg. Well, that must mean that Norm Duke is more comfortable with the left lane. And I watched him in practice, and he was trying everything. Didn't really look like he had found anything that was to his liking. As we can see, Tim Chris, a lot of strikes in that right-hand lane. What happens during commercial? You know, you just have to wonder. He's absolutely lined in, knows exactly where he wants to throw the ball. Take a minute or two break through the nose. It's usually lack of speed. And I remember that many times it would happen to me also. I would be blind in and then as he makes that stare, when you come back after commercial, you almost have to tell yourself, okay, remember what you were doing before. Let's do it the same way. Of course, the adrenaline's not pumping quite the same and that makes a difference. Yeah, it, it most certainly does. You see Norm Duke, five foot five from Claremont, Florida. Great player with a lot of talent. And knocks over the 10 pin in that opening frame. As you can see, Norm Duke now 13th on the list of PBA millionaires trying to move up a couple of notches. I'm sure he'll do that. We're three of the top five on the telecast this afternoon. Yeah, we're very fortunate to have great players on today. Hey, what uh, of course is not shown on that graphic there is the guy in fourth place is the guy sitting next to me, Marshall Holt. <laughs> yeah, for fourth place and holding steady. Big shot for Norm. To boost his confidence. An early double. Ooh, the oh, solid oh. ten. Great shot. Not a great result. Well, he's found the pocket, but will that ball carry? We'll take a look at this ball going into the pocket. Now watch the six pin, the second from the right, as it just whirls around the 10 pin. Norm will throw the ball very, very straight for this spare conversion. And no problem. A little problem with the approach or something, but he didn't foul, so has the spare. Tim Chris on the right lane, second frame. It's an even match right now. His bowling goal, Mike, is just to make a living bowling. And seems to be doing that. Leaves the soft ten pin. Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I might use some other verbiage to describe my feelings on a ten pin, but Tim Chris says yuck. <laughs> well, I don't think he liked the way the ball hit. I think he was describing the way it hit. <laughs> yeah. Cross lane at the 10 pin, straight at it, and has it. Robin Roberts brings sports and entertainment together tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time when her guests include SB's host, Jeff Foxworthy, and from HBO show, Arliss Robert Wool. Catch In the Sportlight with Robin Roberts right here on ESPN. Tim Chris now trailing by only one pin going into the third frame. That ball's got to stop hooking. He's the, lost the left lane. Three nine. He was light the first game, and now suddenly he's going high. Early. This is in his. This is in his delivery. You can't really tell with that shot, but he did not get the ball projected out. Remember in his in his interview, he said projection is the key to his game. And projection means what? Just to project the ball out onto the lane to get it down the lane to make sure the ball doesn't hook too soon. Kind of the positive side of don't set it short. Exactly right. And he makes a nice spare with a 3-9. Not an easy spare to make. 
Norm Duke's been in the pocket on both of his shots with a three pin lead. Leaves a four pin, so we've got a struggle here going on in our semifinal match as the players are suddenly not striking as easily as they did in the previous two yeah, matches. The lanes are transitioning, are, are having a little bit of a transition, and the bowlers may be tightening up a little bit as we get closer to our championship game. At the four pin, backs it in there, and you may have heard when Norm threw that first shot left the four pin, there were some people kind of applauding. They're not, they're not trying to give him a bad time. They thought that he struck. So we see Norm Duke, now he takes a lot of steps. One, two, I think probably six or seven steps. He changes from time to time. The shoulder high backswing. He's got a beautiful game. Gets so close to that foul line, it's amazing. <laughs> Back in the pocket and leaves another temp in. The carry just not there. Norm shaking his head, never a good sign. He had the same problem in practice. That was the ball that he was able to get to the pocket the most consistently with, but he couldn't knock over the pin. So he's got a real problem to try and solve. Do I stay with this ball and just, you know, take the chances of it not carrying? As you see, he's had 34 career 300 games. Won't be having one this game. Or does he make the ball change to go for one that might hit harder, but might be harder to control? What would you do? Well, I would, uh, I would stay with the same ball and try and make it strike. That might not be the right thing, but that's, that's, that's how I always uh, bowled. That's your conservative nature. I suppose ball. it is. <laughs> conservative on the lanes. And Chris, solid temp in. Weak temp in, now solid temp in. He didn't saying. say, no, he didn't say yuck on that shot. He liked that, and Sherry liked that shot. She's just wondering, well, gosh, hon, how come the temp in didn't fall? She looks a lot more worried than he does. Yeah, well, it's always toughest on the wives because they have very little control. They can't throw any bowling balls down there. Nice and straight, good conversion. Still only trails by a couple of pins. Two pins of difference. We're in the fifth frame semi-final match here the championship round finals of the Northwest Classic here in Richland, Washington at Fiesta Bowl. This is Mike Durbin along with Marshall Holman. In our opening match, Pete Weber defeated Walter Ray Williams Jr., but then Tim Chris defeated Tim Chris. Or, <laughs> defeated <laughs> Pete Weber. Oh, figured it out on that night. Got that ball in the pocket. You know, he struck seven times against Pete Weber. And that's the first strike he's had against Norm Duke. Well, he's liable to throw seven in a row now. Now let's see if Norm is staying with that same ball. No, he is not. He has switched balls. He's going for better carry. I think this ball goes straighter. Well, it went too straight. <laughs> he was looking for better carry. He got a very good break. Now we see, you can see him watching, trying to figure out what this ball is doing. Watch how straight this ball goes. That's a combination of his release, and this is the less reactive ball. Carries a very, very fortunate two-pin off the wall. Says, oh, I'll take that. Is he going to stay with that ball on nope. lane 31? No, he's, uh, he's switched back to the ball that he was having trouble knocking all 10 pins down with, but he was getting it to the pocket. Hi. All right. Almost crosses that... over, leaves the six pin. Yeah, that was just a bad shot. He did not get that ball out on the lane. He set it short, ball hooked early. He's uh, talking to himself, but he's fortunate because Tim Chris is not doing a lot right now. He still finds himself with a two pin lead, even though he's only had two strikes and this will be his fourth spare of the match. Philly Frames has been no problem. Stringing strikes, certainly a problem for both players. Our semi-final match is halfway over. The difference is two pins. Noam Dick has them. Will he hang on to them? Well, we'll find out what Chris does when we come back. Stay with us. Up. Tim Chris, sixth frame, working on a strike, can take the lead for the first time in the match right here. And he's on the lane that he could not miss in the previous game. Coming out of commercials, see if he keeps his speed up. Good looking shot. And a great result. Now what's the difference with that one that knocked over the temp just in the hand release? Well, it's, it's the entry angle. 
into the pocket. That's what makes the difference in whether you carry that 10 pin or not. We can watch the entry angle of this ball. It's, it goes very, very long, then starts making that steep entry into the pocket. Six pin takes care of the 10 pin for the last time it went around it. Eight pins, the difference, Chris has them. Trying for three in a row, lane 31. Boy, they're getting some breaks hitting that nose and breaking these splits. Yeah, they're not. I keep wanting to help it over there. You see what he just said? He said, why do I keep trying to help it? And the reason he's trying to help it is because he's afraid if he lets it go, it won't get back. As you can see, this ball never got far enough to the right. It's going right through the heart. You can see the difference. The entry ankle was much different on that particular shot. Fortunate to leave a makeable spare. No trouble with the 6-10. The different six pins. Duke searching for the answers. And they're giving, he's, Tim Chris is giving Norm Duke a lot of opportunities to figure out this championship pair. He's back to that same red ball he was using earlier in the match. Hooks it in there perfectly. Norm can hook it, he can throw it straight. I asked him, how do you choose which to do when? Well, you know, that's a tough thing. And I've, I've come to say to myself, all right, let the lane dictate everything. And that way I put the onus on myself. If I'm really sharp at, at throwing the ball straight and hooking it, and I'm confident at it, then the lane will dictate that to me. Where you get a problem is if you're really confident at one and not the other, you kind of choose the one you're confident with, and that'll get you in trouble. Mike, on that last shot, he used the same ball, but he threw it a little bit straighter. Oh, he trips the four pin out of there. He says, about time. He's gone back to the original ball, but he's changed his release. He's not trying to hook the ball quite as much. As you can see, a great break right here for the double. It's coming in high. Trips out the four seven. So is he playing for the ball to hold? Now Tim Chris is down by four pins. Eighth frame, working on a spare. His good lane. That's why maybe the biggest shot of his young career coming up right here. Oh, I, I agree with you 100%, Mike. He's on the tougher of the two lanes, a lane that he's afraid to trust the ball on. All right. He's got a chance to double, get back into the lead, put the pressure back on Norm Duke. Does he trust the ball? We'll just have to wait and see. I'm sure that's what he's thinking in his mind. It has to be. He did. He trusted it. And it worked. What a great shot in a huge, huge position in the game. This match goes back and forth. Tim Chris doubling to take the lead back by six pins. You know, Norm Duke has such good touch with the way that he releases the ball. He can control the amount of revolutions that he puts on the ball to go back into the lead. Just never comfortable. Leaves the 6-10, still in the match. Well, you can see the angle of this shot. It was just left of target, right off his hand. And once again, our players are fortunate that they're not leaving splits. Staying with that ball to shoot the spare, he'll throw it hard and straight. Ooh, he's got it. What's he asking for? He's asking for tape. He's okay. asking for tape. He didn't, uh, that's, I think that's what he was disappointed with. Ball didn't feel right. Shot. He didn't have the proper feel of the ball. You know, when you're out there bowling under the lights and it is warm down there, your hand has a tendency to, to shrink and swell. So he's using a sure hook in that ball, putting tape behind it. He uses the, a cork insert and tape behind it, very much like what I've done for the, for the majority of my career. I've, I've stopped doing that in the last couple of years, but I, I used to always use the tape in back of the cork. Tim Chris is watching as he has an eight pin lead on Norm Duke. Right there, maybe his best shot of the game, right there. Well, right there he forces Tim Chris to show up in the 10th frame with one more strike. He would force Tim Chris to strike the first ball in the 10th frame. One more, takes a two-pin lead. For the lead. And knocks the 10-pin. Oh, yeah. 
And I'm sure Karen's at home right now running him out, his young son, Brandon. I wonder if Norm's dog, Mandy, is watching. I don't know. Both players looking over at the score as we look at a replay of that last shot. What a great shot. And watch the action of the six pin as it just annihilates the ten. Now he needs nine, right? And he loves it. He says, that's the one. He needs at least nine pins. Actually, if he gets eight, eight pins, yeah. eight pins, it forces Tim Chris to strike. He's going to throw the ball hard and straight right down the middle. A very professional shot for the fill shot. Didn't want to take a chance of leaking it out too far and getting six or seven. It forces Tim Chris to get up and throw a strike on his good lane. You, you know, you, you once again have to wonder, why would Norm let him finish on lane 32? Well, he, he struck out on 31 where he had to. That's why. Maybe he wants to post the score first. Yeah. A lot of players like to finish first. Tim Chris for the win. And did you see Norm saying, great shot? And his wife, Sherry, is just crushed by that. But it's a very much like Pete Weber. When he made the shot, it just didn't respond as far as knocking all the pins down. You know, it's little consolation, but it feels better in the long run when you made a good shot and it doesn't get a strike than if you get up there and, and dog it through the, through the nose. With a strike here, he'll finish with 213. Norm Duke shoots 215. Tim Chris finishes with 211 and loses by 215 to Norm Duke. So that's his best finish. Third place is the highest place he's ever finished in a PBA tournament with $7,000. Our next stop coming up is the PBA Oregon Open. That's March the 1st, next week, 5.30 Eastern Time. And then the tour goes to ABC with the AC Delco Classic, 3.30. Coming March 8th. We're going to be coming back with Championship Frame, a review of our three previous matches. Stay tuned. Now it's time for Championship Frame. In our opening match, Pete Weber just needed 16 pins in the 10th frame, Marshall. And all professionals, when they need a mark of the 10th, they want to strike. Pete Weber gives us his best shot, throws the ball wide, watch it hook. And there's a nice, friendly 16 fill. Just another mild reaction by Pete Weber as he defeated the great Walter Ray Williams Jr. 258 to 244, setting up match number two, where Chris had the upper hand. He's in the ninth frame here. And a key shot for Tim Chris, a chance to really put a lot of pressure on Pete Weber. Projects the ball nicely down the lane, very wide, coming in flush, 10 in the pit. He's talking to it, must have talked right. Final score, Chris, 226, Weber, 201. Setting up the semifinal match. Duke and Chris. Chris needed a strike to win. And young Tim Chris gives it his best shot. Absolutely throws the ball right where he wants to. Good projection, good revolutions, good everything. Ten pin wiggles. Norm Duke wins. He likes it, but he doesn't like the result. Final score. Duke, 215. Chris, 211. Setting up our title match, and we'll see the championship trophy for the Northwest Classic. The winner of the next match is going to get that trophy. And the two guys are going to vie for it, Brian Voss, Norm Duke. thing they have in common, besides being champions and the Hall of Famers, is that they both stayed at Mark Frank's home this week. We'll be right back. Once in a There's that championship trophy. A beautiful thing to look at. The capacity crowd here at Fiesta Bowl in anticipation of what we hope will be an exciting title match between two great champions, Norm Duke, Brian Boss, and two very good friends. You know, Mike, Norm Duke has made six out of 11 telecasts in Mark Frank-owned bowling center, so... Uh, no wonder he stays at his house. Yes, that's... Oh, what a way to start.
start the championship match. Norm Duke won our semifinal match. He's the first one to win this afternoon without getting five strikes on lane 32. He just got a couple of strikes over there. And he'll just go for the count here. Early in the match, if, you, if you're going to make a, a big mistake, it's good to get it out of the way early. As you see, his last title was August of 95, in Bedford, Ohio. At the three. Has him, but eight out in the opening frame. And Brian Voss, who looked a little more lined in in practice than Norm Duke did an hour, hour and a half ago, will step up on lane 32 and see what he can do. Brian Voss, 62 previous television appearances. He's 58 and 48 in those games with a 220 average. And a solid 10 to start the title match. Made a good shot. Didn't quite get the results he wanted. As you can see, Brian Voss, 38-year-old pro from Atlanta, Georgia. His wife, Andrea, and he has two children, Joshua and Cameron. I'm sure they're back in Atlanta rooting for daddy. Cross lane at the tenth pin. Hard and straight at it. Players have had no trouble with single pin scores today. No, not at all. We've had very, very accurate players. Even though they can put a lot of power on the ball, these are all good spare shooters. That was kind of a, a, a misnomer years ago with, uh, with Mark Roth and the big hook he used to throw. People didn't realize just what a great spare shooter he also was. backers all right he's in the pocket as we see the director of operations for the PBA Bobby Dinkins looks like he's trying to knock him down for the pros cross lane again at the 10 pin Brian see. Voss defeated Norm Duke twice in match play trying to make it Three times. Tries for the hat trick here. Yeah. Right? He averaged 223 against Norm, or yes, against Norm Duke. And I think right now a 223 would probably win this tournament as the pros are out there kind of searching. Ooh. Almost a solid nine. Can he go a little wider with that? That ball got further down the lane, further to the right and then broke harder in the back end. We'll take a look at this shot. You're always talking about entry angle. Well, watch how this ball creeps further down the lane. It gets about out to two board. Now it's got to stop hooking. Fortunately, it did. The ball didn't touch that nine pin, but something did. For the double. Perfect. Hey, what a great adjustment. After leaving that wide open five count split, Duke comes back with a couple strikes, and now Brian Voss has only a one-pin lead. We talked about that just a minute ago. These guys make show after show after show, don't and they? And that's a, that's a very good, uh, very good record, 58 and 48. The 220 average. That's got a hook. Boy, it does. Boy, it looked like he just softened up that speed, uh, uh, Iota. Just enough. Did you see Brian Voss? I'll tell you right now, if you if you got a youngster. Tell him to watch this this particular delivery. Beautiful, beautiful form. Nice, solid push away. Relaxed arm swing, shoulder high. Gets a good knee bend and reaches, reaches out to that target. So in balance, too. And look at the result. When you make a good shot, everything responds. Would love to get this double and take an 11-pin lead. Going high. Uh -oh. Leaves the 310. He yelled at it, but it didn't do any good. Tried to soften up again. Yeah, it looked like it looked like, it looked like he kind of helped it. You know, that was a lane that Tim Chris was afraid to trust it on. It's because there's more hang on lane 31. Farther apart. He's saying they're further apart. But there was a pin that knocked it over there, right. not the machine. The machine did not did knock them knock them apart. Can he make it? Oh. 
Watch how far apart they are. He made that look too easy. Amazing the way he did that, too. Just further left, hard and straight. Right. He, what he did on that particular spare is he eliminated the lane. Norm Duke is asking about the shot clock. <laughs> Needs to compose himself. Get back into his rhythm. And they restarted the shot clock. For the lead. Oh, the solid 10. Had a few of those today. Boy, he had to like the way through that ball. He's shaking his head. I think he's just shaking his head at that darn 10 pin. No, he, he did with his elbow there. He's well, saying that he chicken winged it a hair. Yeah, maybe. I guess, I guess he did. Or turned it early a little bit or something. Well, it looked good to us. It looked good to me. I, I liked it. Evidently, he didn't. At the 10 pin. Has the spare. The three-year-olds take to the track in Hallandale, Florida, in this section of the Florida Derby, the Fountain of Youth. Get a good look at some possible Kentucky Derby contenders as they run for $200,000 in prize money today, 4 p. 4.30 Eastern Time, right here on ESPN. Norm Duke trailing by two pins. Wants to get that ball in the 1-3 pocket and have them all respond. Well, That's what he's looking for. Well, Duke, he's got both lanes with the pocket figured out. He's starting to, to become a little more comfortable, and, you know, that's where the, where the champion or the leader of the tournament has a big disadvantage. He has to watch everybody bowl and then come out and just turn it on immediately. <laughs> Two pins a difference, fifth frame. Gets that 10 pin. Brian Boss has won for 10 consecutive years. I've asked him, how important is it to continue this streak? Well, I love winning. Uh, you know, you never seem to win enough, but I, I love winning more than anything in the world besides my wife. Um, I want to keep it going. It's my goal every week to win a tournament, uh, uh, but I want to win. I want to I win for 20 years. This is a, a chance to do it. So that kind of passion will get it done. And this is a chance to double right here. This is a lane that he didn't trust it on and went high. Previous shot. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Well, I know that when he throws when he throws this ball, the only thing he's thinking about right now is, please carry, because I've done everything I can do to put this ball high flush in the pocket. Please carry. Oh, it did. Norm Duke down by 12. Uh, the 2-8, it didn't make it up. And he thought that ball was going to hook. He started running that ball out. He had to feel good about that shot or else he wouldn't have been on the run. Well, it could be that, you know, he was hoping he got a little wide, the dry area would bring it back. I'm familiar with that feeling. Well, that's exactly what he was trying to do. It just, uh, as he, now he's still messing with that tape. He's not completely comfortable with the way his ball is feeling. Now is he going to throw the ball straight, or is he going to hook the ball at the 2-8? I always like to hook the ball when I left when I left the spare, but Norm Duke going to throw it straight. Has the spare. He's looking at the score right now. And the score is 12 pins deficit for Norm Duke. And Voss lined in on both lanes yeah looking good now brian is also working on his ball neither one of these guys are having a lot of success with getting the proper feel got to stop oh, just barely <laughs> big break for norm the ball never does get far enough to the right as norm's kind of laughing about this shot watch how high in the pocket it is trips out the four the six the seven the ten Oh, boy. Everything. Thank you, he says. Loss. Chance to go up 22 pins. Working on two in a row. There's three. The Ray 
Rangers boast three of the NHL's top eight scorers in Messier, Gretzky, and Leach. Number nine on that list is the Flyers' John LeClaire, who, along with Eric Lindros, look to outscore the Rangers at home. That's tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern time, for this division rivalry here on ESPN. Brian Voss on the left-hand lane, wanting to keep the pressure on Norm Duke to go up by 32 pins. He likes it. Oh, yeah. he loves it. The 10 pin scoots out of there. And you know, Brian took command of this tournament very, very early. Watch this shot as he swings the ball far to the right, slow speed. Here it comes, it's light, will it carry? Oh, yes. Looked like he was getting ready to slide into <laughs> first base. Almost a must strike for Norm, and he comes in light, he comes in high, he's lost. This is, the ball's not supposed to do that. When I move, after being light, it's supposed to go in the pocket, not high. Yeah, just doesn't quite have good command on that right-hand lane right now. Three, six, nine, ten, tough spare. Has to make it to stay in the match at all. Needs to hook the ball enough to get that back sleeper pin. Look out. Uh, and he goes right past it in pretty much Brian Voss's tournament right now. Brian Voss first took the lead in this tournament in the third round and never, ever looked back. He really was in command. You know, he has a habit of doing that. I can remember once at the PBA National in Toledo, once he got in front, he just never looked back. And they came out on the telecast and shot 250. Some people have a tough time in the lead. Brian Voss doesn't seem to mind it at all. No. Well, a little anticlimactic here is Norm Duke in the ninth frame, trailing by 44 pins, knows that this is a lost cause. Shooting the spare before the rake is even up. He just wants to get out of Brian Voss's way. These two are very, very good friends. I know how disappointed Norm Duke is right now, but I also know that he's, he's happy and he's proud of his buddies. We see this round by round. You can see Brian Voss took the man. Never below fourth. Tim Chris led it the first two rounds, and then Brian Voss said, I think I'll take this all the way. Leaves the 10 pin, but he really doesn't care. Yeah, he's looking over the scoreboard right now and uh, should make him smile. That's it. That's it, he says. You know, really, maybe the key shot of this match might have been back when he made the baby split in the fourth frame that kept him clean, and he kept four in a row after that. But it kept him in the lead. Kept Norm Duke from, from taking a lead and maybe grabbing a little momentum. Tenth frame. Boss. Yeah, well, that's a little... The six pin. You know, when you've got it all wrapped up, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's tough to keep going up there and making those those crisp shots. He didn't didn't have to make a, a real good shot there. Just keep it on the lane. He knows he's won this tournament, and he extends his streak to yet another year of winning a title on the PBA Tour. 11 years, and of course, the great Earl Anthony holds the record with 14. And Brian Voss wants that record. It's been a year. Brian's very emotional about this victory. Come on! Yeah! 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 Stay down! Uh. Well, tears of joy for Brian Voss. I'm sure Andre is probably weeping too back in Atlanta. Hey, by the way, these things are pretty tough here, okay? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Oh. It's all, well, I, I, heard, I heard nothing, Brian. I heard nothing. Brian. Brian turning this into a uh, PG-rated show. <laughs> you know, finding it when it's a... Uh, as... High five going here. Come on, Come on Right, for, for Brian, yeah. it, it yeah. isn't, it's not about how much prize money he won as you see norm duke finishing second for ninety five hundred dollars 
for Brian, it is all about winning. Real nice win. All about oh, winning. Yeah. Title number 17. Yeah. You can see his friend, proprietor Mark Frank, giving him a little hug of congratulations. Dorfdu finishes with 185. Our championship match. Final score is Brian Boss, 227. Norm Duke, 185. That's 11 years in a row for Brian Boss, and we'll be back to talk with him to see what his thoughts are on it. Don't you touch that remote. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The champion of the Northwest Classic, a very emotional Brian Boss. Hey, uh, you know, I'm bowling out there against one of my best buddies. Uh, you know, it, it's tough. It's been a long time since I won. Matter of fact, it's been a year. Uh, and I haven't led a tournament in a lot of years, so this was really, really a big event for me. Is it easier or tougher from the number one position? Well, it used to be pretty tough, but I think the last five or six times that I've, I've led, I, I, my, my stats got a little bit better, so I'll take my chances any time with one game. Real quick, hi, honey, my, my wife's home, I know you're watching, my kids, Josh and Cameron, yeah. All right, all right, hi, hi everybody, hi to my brothers, sisters, mom. We'll be back to talk more with Brian Voss and Norm Duke right after these messages. Now, don't you hit that remote, because we'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. And joining us is the runner-up, Norm Duke, and uh, my partner, Marshall Holman, has a question for both of these guys. Norm, it looked like during practice you were having trouble getting yourself lined in, and, and even in the matches, it looked like you were a little bit sort of struggling, but you gutted it out. What was it like out there? I was a lost dog out there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, just to, to be victorious over Tim Chris was a big, I mean, that was huge. I just happened to gut out two shots, and, and he, he threw a great shot and missed, but I just wanted to see Brian cry. <laughs> well, well you, you got your wish. And speaking of Brian, Brian, both Mike Durbin and I felt like that 310 conversion really helped you keep the momentum. You threw four in a row right after it. Was that as big as it looked? Absolutely. I mean, anytime you get a little split up there, Odds are 50-50 against missing it. I miss. I'm behind. Uh, you know, there's always little tiny confidence boosters, and that certainly was one of them. Well, congratulations. It was a great victory for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brian, now it's 11 years in a row. Of course, the record is held by another Northwest guy, Earl Anthony. Is that uh, insights? Well, I hope Earl's watching now, because I'm all over you, buddy. <laughs> hey, uh, this is just, you know, you want to win every single year, and, and to keep it going, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to the 14th year, uh, uh, that's when it's going to be a little tougher, I think. Well, now this is career victory number 17, and uh, your man who sets goals is, is 20 uh, on the horizon? Hey, 20's this year, baby. You got it. <laughs> this year. Oh. This year. I suppose you're going for 22 to catch Walter Ray beating myself. Yes, absolutely. I love winning. There's nothing like Say it. Say goodbye. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. For Marshall Holman, this is Mike Durbin saying so long from Richland, Washington, where Brian Boss is the winner of the Northwest Classic. Be sure to join us next week for the Oregon Open. That's March 1st, 5.30 Eastern Time. Stay tuned for Coca-Cola Race and Reel. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports.